Okay, so uh, for the five of you here who don't know who I am, um, <laughs> my name is Ian Crow. I am the sponsor and prize coordinator for IGX and have been since 2017. Um, I am also the guy making most of the announcements, so if you hate my voice tonight, sorry, too bad. <laughs> I will also be doing the award ceremony tomorrow. We have a raffle. you got to be present. If you're not there, you're not getting the raffle prize. When's the award ceremony? Uh, at 6.30. So, words 6.30 tomorrow, make sure you are here. If I draw your name from the raffle, and you're not, you don't get it. Is that AM or PM? <laughs> <laughs> if you are awake at 6.30 AM, you're welcome to be here, we won't be. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I asked that this question is too. the <laughs> first of the lectures for IGX this year um, at night. Christian Trustclair did his in the afternoon, but this is the first of, I'm going to call it our fireside chats, because that sounds fancy. Um, I will be talking about dueling in the Viking Age. Um, before I get into exactly <laughs> my presentation, uh, I started fencing in 2010, um, did HEMA in 2014, and got into living history reenactment with my wife, who's doing null binding right there, which, if you ask me, is complete magic. Um, <laughs> Very late 2019, we got the full authentic experience. Here we are doing very early medieval Viking Age stuff, and we got the play. Um, but I've been doing it for a few years, um, and I also, I mean, I fence a ton of weapons. You saw me in armor. Um, I predominantly do saber, but my approach to HEMA is I would like to be able to reach into a bag blind, pick up a weapon, and be able to at least look like I know what I'm doing with it. Uh, some people like to specialize in one weapon. I'd rather... But, uh, do all of them. Uh, but that's not why I am qualified to talk about this. The Viking group I am with is called Stormfjeda. Uh We used to be called Draugr Vinlands. You may have tripped over us at an event. Our name changed. Long story doesn't matter. Um, we've been around since 2012 in one form or another. Some of our members have actually been on the History Channel. If you've seen America's Lost Vikings, you have seen some of our members as the reenactors. We used to have a great partnership with the uh, Draken down in uh, Mystic Seaport before they kind of moved it and, and that changed. We've been at multiple Ren Fairs, History Alive, Vermont Military Expo. So needless to say, our group's been around. Um, and one of the things we do is we meet kind of every week as best we can. We're supposed to meet every week. Sometimes people can't. And we are in kit. Living as they did. If our camp needs to be uh, repaired, we're doing that repair work in kit. If we need to haul firewood, we're doing that in kit. That way, we know what they did. And to be honest, it's so our kit looks good. You always hate when you go to a reenactment and it looks like you have a bunch of soldiers who are supposed to be on campaign look like they're, you know, on prey. That doesn't make sense. They should look ratty. They should look beat up. And we're aiming to get that authentic look. Why am I talking about this? Um, for those of you who do understand HEMA, um, it starts about 1300 with I-33. The Viking Age technically falls out of the traditional sphere of what we refer to as HEMA. Um, you can call it Western martial arts. If you're fighting, trying to figure out to fight as they did, you can call it um, re reconstructive archaeology. You can do stuff like that, but it's technically not <coughs> HEMA. However, HEMA, you might be surprised to hear, is all about dueling. I know, shocker. All of our treatises, all of our sources tend to deal with one opponent. Um, so, dueling in the Viking Age, dueling in Hema, there's a common theme there. The other big thing here is I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about the honor culture of the Viking Age. That way you can understand why they're fighting duels all the time. That honor culture led to the culture you even still see in modern Germany, um, with Mansur and academic fencing, that manly nature of standing there and willingly getting a scar on your cheek without flinching, without complaining, although I don't think the Vikings stuck lemon juice in any of their scars to make them bigger. Um, but that culture has to come from somewhere, and it comes from this um, era. Now, I'm going to get the biggest elephant out of the room, because I can bet Kyle and some other people who know the Vikings um, are already cringing at how I'm using that word. Traditionally speaking, Viking is a profession. One goes Viking. It is a boat of Vikings because they are there to take your stuff. This is someone, typically Nordic, who shows up at about 4 a.m., hops out of their boat, burns down your farm, takes all your gold, takes all your women, and runs off before you can do anything. 
Um, some translations are up there. My favorite, and it's used in a translation of Ale Saga, is Freebooter. I'm not sure why they felt the need to translate Viking, but Freebooter is probably my favorite translation for this. Um, the thing is, pop culture disagrees with that, that word. Um, this word also tends to refer to anyone who lived from roughly 800 to 1000 AD in your traditional countries of Denmark, Norway, Sweden, <coughs> Iceland, Greenland, the Faroe Islands, parts of Finland, parts of Russia, England, Ireland, Scotland, quite a few places, all united by relatively similar cultures and religions. Uh, the Vikings spread pretty far. Uh, Byzantine Empire as well, they were all over. And this is the term that pop culture has decided, you know what, there's no good English word to refer to people from that area, so we're just going to call them Vikings. This is pretty traditionally accurate, considering the English, way back, or the Anglo-Saxons, way back in 900 AD, just called them all Danes, regardless of where they were from. And in fact, we have named a tall, long-handled axe, about this tall on average, the Dane axe, despite it being used by almost every culture that decided axes on big handles make good weapons. It's called the Dane axe. So, misnaming them is accurate. I'm going to use Vikings. You know what I mean. Um, and if this really bothers you, deal with it. <laughs> I already got asked about um, where my sources are from. So the Viking society kind of lacked paper um, or just didn't want to write stuff down, despite seeming to generally be fairly literate, considering we have graffiti all over the world from them that translates to, this is very high, half Dan was here. <laughs> so they clearly knew how to write, um, but they didn't rely on that to transmit their histories. Instead, it was oral transmission via the sagas. Thing is, the sagas are uh, Viking Age infotainment. Trying to learn from them is probably closer to trying to learn from the movie Braveheart than a textbook. But it's what we have. This is how they told their history. Um, they take chronology be damned. Um, they take important people in the story, put them with other important people from history, and that way they could tell whatever happened, a famous battle, how a king got deposed, why Iceland has a fifth court. All of that through the uh, characters of these sagas. Whether or not it actually made sense, you'll regularly see these sagas where something happens in 975, and then they go ahead and do something after that that we know happened in 940. Um, all of these were generally transmitted orally until uh, 12, 1300, when a bunch of Christians decided, you know what, maybe we should write these things down. So we got Christians writing about pagans for political reasons hundreds of years after they happened. Is there issues with these sagas? Yes. But they often do point to historical events that we can nail down with more objective sources. So there's a grain of truth to them in the same way that Braveheart does get at least some of the character names right. <laughs> I am not going to spend a lot of time talking about how pop culture gets the Vikings wrong, um, but I got into this because pop culture gets the Vikings wrong. If you've seen, uh, you've seen the History Channel of the Vikings, this, this crap. Um, you know, they're always dressed like hipsters that either dress at a Hot Topic or a uh, Ren Fair. Um, they're afraid of taking a bath, they always get dirt on their face, and the closest they ever get to the Viking mindset is, ah, oh, kings are bad. No. Vikings were well-groomed so much that, uh, Christians complained about it because they were stealing all the women by not smelling like a horse. <laughs> um, they were slavers, unrepentant slavers, that was how they made their money, and they were obsessed with revenge, not to mention that they had a code of honor which meant you didn't steal from people, you gave them a chance, loose word there, to defend themselves. So that's why the raids tended to be violent, because if they're taking something from you, they let you defend yourself, even if it was knocking at your door, while your barn was already at fire, on fire at 4 a.m. Technically, you could have done something, I guess. <laughs> so, that's enough intro. Let's get into uh, let's get into the honor culture, because um, there's a lot to it. So more vocabulary words for you. Don't worry, there isn't a test. 
Um, and I've only picked the ones that I can myself say, so they aren't very long. Um, so one of the big words to know is Drenger. This is someone who is generally all positive traits. Brave, trustworthy, generous, chivalrous. They are people you would like, minus uh, one key detail. A Dranger never took an insult lying down. You were expected to stand up for yourself, so you loved this guy until you insulted him at Mario Kart and he demanded money from you to avenge that slight or wanted to take you out behind the woodshed. The opposite of that is nothing. This is, funnily enough, not where the English word nothing comes from, despite a reasonable logical chain there. That actually comes from the old English word nothing. Um, but a nothing is the opposite of a dragger. This is someone who is cowardly, disloyal, doesn't stand up for themselves, um, in the Viking sense, womanly. Um, well, you may not like a dranger because the, their idea of what is proper behavior doesn't necessarily jive with today. Anything is objectively bad. No one would like them even today. But neath or shame, isn't just a bad person. The Vikings viewed Neath as a magical force. In one of the accounts of Earl Hauken, uh, he pissed off someone whose name I honestly couldn't pronounce, so we're just going to go with someone, um, who showed up, pulled out, I'm going to say a parchment because it's funny. Presumably he memorized it, but it's just funny if you just see this guy walk up like this. And then insulted Earl Halkin so badly through this that his beard fell out, his long haul grew dark, and Earl Halkin damn near died from it. They viewed words as having power, and you could inflict me through words, but uh, if it was the winner, he had an extra horse, um, and you didn't feel like going there, well, you get a stick, you carve some insults and curses on it, you kill a horse, you shove the head on a stick, you point it at their land, this is a scorn and pull, you will inflict Neath on them remotely. <laughs> <laughs> it works. The upside is, you could generally avoid becoming Neathing if you just behaved in ways even today we'd agree with. Don't steal, you know, make sure they can defend themselves. A bit. <laughs> um, don't murder, and this is killing at night. This is killing people who couldn't defend themselves, you know, sleeping men, unarmed men, women, children. Um, and one of the things about this is killing people at night, even as an execution, you also didn't do. No matter how much they deserved it, you didn't kill at night. <clears throat> there was a taboo against that. Uh, the other big thing, don't show up to a duel. You're shocked. Yes? I have a question about the back killing at night. Okay. So uh, you, you said like you could you, they would often rape people in the middle of the night to steal their shit. Morning. Morning. Oh, morning. 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 Oh, thank you. I'm saying 4 a.m. But okay. This is Scandinavia. Your sun rises pretty early in the in the. Uh, that, that's that's fair. Yes. Thank you. Um. Yes. You didn't kill at night, but right after the sun rose, now nah, that was fine. <laughs> <laughs> it happens in El Saga. Boy, does the actions that we have accounts for somewhat violate this taboo against people not being able to defend themselves because they rules layered the hell out of it. <laughs> now, once you became a Neathan, if you did any of this and people knew, you might as well just fall on your sword because no one would house you, no one would support you, no one would talk for you. Um, you, you wouldn't be lodged anywhere, your family would turn on you. You were persona non grata in a hardcore way. They didn't even need to outlaw you to make sure you were dead. So yeah, bad, don't do this. The other, uh, big thing, so you want to be a diner. You want to be honorable, you want to be good, but how does pe how do people know that you're a good person and that your family comes from a bunch of good people? And that's what's theory. This is a fun little rune. It's a TH. Um, this translates to word glory. It's a beautiful translation because English literal translation, you can figure out what it means. Um, 
This is to basically be spoken of well after you die. You don't believe me that this was sought after. How many of these names do you recognize? Harold Bluetooth, Ivar the Boneless, Leif Erikson, Eric Bloodaxe, my favorite nickname. <laughs> Alfred the Great, Harold Fairhair, Hulkin the Good. Even if you do not know Vikings very well, you probably recognize at least one name on that list. Probably Leif Erikson. We have a Leif Erikson day. Um, but all of these people, because I am talking about them a thousand years later, and you know the names, have achieved Orthseer. Yes, Kyle. You have a question? I was just going to say, on top of Leif Erikson, if any of you have a phone, you know Harold Bluetooth. That too. Uh, dumb little trivia thing, I could have put it here. The logo for Bluetooth is the bind rune for Harold Bluetooth. Uh, I, know. Um, I did not know that. Yes. He was big on communication, henceforth why his name is associated with wireless technology. He's like, you know, it would be really great if I could send a message to someone and they actually get it. <laughs> <laughs> See, um, that would be great on there. Were there Norse people who said that he had a North Steer or... We know them, Anglo-Saxon culture, particularly due to how many Vikings were there, there's a lot of overlap. Um, so I included his name, because he's certainly someone we know. <coughs> um, but don't take your history books for you, or your cell phone. Odin himself speaks about this. There is a book called The Have em All, um, which is a collection of Odin's words and wisdom, and there's... Nice verse here, which is cut off slightly. I am not going to read the Old Norse, mostly because it won't do you any good. Um, cows die, family die, you will die the same, but a good reputation never dies for the one who earns it. When the head honcho of your pantheon says, yo, care about what people think about you, you should probably do it. Um, and that did include defending yourself against any and all slights. And one of the most insulting ways you can insult someone, at least a man, is to call them a woman, suggesting they had the heart of a mare, they were familiar with women's work, or if they had been buggered. You don't know what that means, find Joe Linden, he's British. <laughs> um, and in case you're wondering, it's only the receiving end. Um, they don't really care what you do, as long as you're doing it in the traditional biological sense, if you're on the receiving end and you aren't traditionally on that, yeah, you're a knee then. You shouldn't do that. Um, and on more remote things, if um, you want to inflict neath on someone and, again, you don't feel like driving there or you're not particularly good with words and can't cast vicious mockery, um, <laughs> you can just send them a dress and that does the same thing. <laughs> now, that I've said that, yes, in the back. How does that fit in? I have a point about that. It's also uh, Thor's wedding. Yeah, I have a point about that too. <laughs> this all builds. <clears throat> so it may seem that I'm on a bit of a tangent. I swear it's not. So you may think, and you may also recognize this person here. He's sitting up front. Um, you may think that because I just said that a man being called a woman was a horrible insult, that this was a society that women were second-class citizens. That is not true. They enjoyed quite a few more privileges than you saw in continental Europe at the time. Um, while it was true that they didn't get much say in who they married, if a suitor wanted to marry a woman, he went to the father or eldest brother, depending on who was alive, they could divorce. Um, and they didn't necessarily need a particularly good reason to divorce. In Cormac's saga, Bercy, uh, is a well-known duelist who uh, loses and gets his butt cheek cut off. His wife, who never really liked him anyhow, it was a marriage of convenience, goes, you're no longer a man. I'm divorcing you, Arts Percy. The name didn't stick, but can you imagine sitting there, recovering from getting your butt cheek cut off, or lying there, probably, and your wife divorces you? Just to clarify, it's just one, one of the butt cheeks. It was only one, yes. He <laughs> smeared <laughs> off a shield and shaved right down his back leg. I think he walked with a bit of a limp. Um, 
So women could divorce them, um, could divorce. They also generally held the household finances. They controlled the money. Math is magic, and that's for women. Um, everything kind of in the hearth was their domain. Everything out of it was the male domain. Um, and they were protected against assault. Um, we have a fine from Anglo-Saxon England of assaulting a female slave was worth about 3,000 modern British pounds in fines. A Norwegian king got ousted because people thought he may have slapped a woman. So they were afforded some protections that we would like and see today. That does not mean, to your point in the back, that um, there wasn't a fairly rigid gender system. The Icelandic law book, the Graugis, which was written down, yes, a couple hundred years after this era, but was um, generally held laws that they knew had occurred during the Viking Age, came from the Viking Age. They just realized, man, having one guy who knows all the laws is really not a fail-proof system. <laughs> I don't know what we do if he gets eaten by a bear. <laughs> um, so gender roles were incredibly well-defined. There's women wearing men's clothing could be fined. Presumably they need to go the other way because men kind of weren't supposed to wear women's clothing. Get to that in a second. Um, so they only needed a law one way. In the movie, The Northman nails this really well. Uh, there's a big arrow here, but I have a fancy pointer. You see this? This guy's got a beard. He's a he-witch. That is a brooch for a women's apron dress. The Northman realized this guy's doing magic, and really doing magic. They show him talking, talking through the dead. He has forfeited his right to be seen as a man because he does magic. He is arguably no longer allowed to, I guess, use he, him pronouns and has to wear a women's dress. Um, so you have this idea, society is incredibly rigid in gender uh, divisions, uh, or not. Um, I say that, and then we have a ton of violations of it. One of the uh, biggest ones is, this is Odin, a 1800s vintage drawing of him, but this is Odin. He does magic. Only women were supposed to do magic, but Odin does magic, and no one would ever call him a woman. Now, you can argue, well, no one's also going to tell Odin what he can and can't do. <laughs> um, but this sort of questions of exactly how rigid those boundaries were has given rise to a theory. And this is an interesting theory to read about. Um, I'm not sure how much stock I put in it, but I pose it because it makes a point for me. There are some scholars who see that the Viking era did not observe the same gender binary we do, in that if you were successful enough, it what plumbing you had didn't matter. If you're a woman, you could enter the male sphere. And if you're a man, you'd better be successful. <laughs> so this is, this is probably the big key thing to understanding why people fought these duels, showed up for them, did them, is men could only stand to lose status. They could only stand to be seen as women, to be seen as anything. Women could gain it, and at worst case, they are lost that again, they wouldn't lose a place in society. Men could only lose that. So now imagine that your right to uh, bring things to a lawsuit, to own property, to be respected, um, was tied to how you performed, and you have you can understand why these duels were so critical. You'd better be a dranger. So let's uh, get into the duels themselves. More vocabulary for you. Uh, the first word is einvigi. This literally translates to one battle. More helpfully, translates to single combat. This is a general term for any and all single combat, often used in these sources in the context of something not regulated. A barroom brawl would be Einvigi, whereas we get to the name of my lecture, Holmgang, is a regulated duel meant to resolve a dispute um, as a physical legal proceeding. These are legal proceedings, not religious ones. Yes, they had some religious trappings, but most scholars agree 
This is a secular event. The gods are not intervening for their favorites. You'd better know how to fight. Thor's not going to bail your ass out. <laughs> um, this translates to island walking, hence the name of my presentation. Um, it's a bit of a poetic translation because they were fought either on an island itself, a small island so you couldn't retreat, or on a cloak, which makes a figurative island. Now, I say, a lot of numbers, don't worry about it. Um, I say that these are legal ways to resolve a dispute. Um, and to get into that, you need to know a little bit about how law worked in Iceland and Norway in the Viking lands. Forensic um, science didn't exist. They weren't really concerned with who did it so much as who was injured and who did the injuring enough to figure out who should be paying compensation and who should get it. Um, and they didn't have prisons, so everything was handled by a fine. Um, which meant that if you wanted any restitution, you had to go to a thing, uh, which is what they called their Congress, their big meetings. It does give rise to thing referring to something we can't define. They were a very complicated chain of meaning, meaning changes and sarcasm. Um, but <clears throat> you brought it to a thing, they'd assess a fine, and I've listed a bunch here. Um, the weights in silver are here. This column is the rough equivalent that my source could come up with for what that silver would be worth now. Silver is a lot cheaper than it was then, so you can't just do a direct per weight comparison. Um, this is an attempt to translate the prices to today. And you can see, if you kill a guy unprovoked who everyone liked and they wanted to make a statement, damn near a quarter million dollars. Don't kill someone without cause. The one annoying part about this, say Kyle attacked me and I killed him in self-defense. Very likely. <laughs> John Moran, as a good friend of his, could demand compensation from me, and while the fact I acted in self-defense might mitigate how much I have to pay, it's not his fault, or it's not John's fault, Kyle attacked me. Which means I have deprived John of a friend and so I have hurt him in a way that he had no control over. I owe him compensation. And I saw a question in the back there. Mika? Yep. No, did you have... I can't, I can't read what... Oh, you, so if you sorry. Can, not all of them, but just I'm curious what some of the... Um, so we have from um, the Anglo-Saxon records. It's what we could find. Again, not a lot was written down. A slave coming in at about six grand. Interestingly enough, a Welshman who didn't owe land at about five grand. <laughs> um, By the way, John, you're welcome. <laughs> a landed thing, so someone who, an earl like someone with status who owed land, 120,000 pounds. Didn't necessarily matter what you did, it mattered who you did it to. And the sagas give us similar prices. A slave's a bit cheaper. Um, the nobility and hierarchy is a little harder to parse through. Um, it's a lot more egalitarian and a lot more uh, meritocracy, so you kind of had to earn your place, so nobility wasn't a term I could directly translate. But someone who was a citizen with respect comes in about 30 grand, an important citizen in about 70 grand, and then that quarter million dollars for an unprovoked killing of someone everyone liked. Uh, that is triple compensation. That is three times what he was worth. That same saga, this is Njell's saga, actually highlights quadruple compensation. But my, I don't have that as a value I can translate, so I gave you the triple compensation, which I can work out. Thank you. Um, so the other issue with these courts is uh, it didn't necessarily matter how ironclad the evidence was. If no one liked you, you weren't going to do well. You in the back. Uh, question about the previous slide. Uh, yes. So, how would those uh, fines, I guess, have compared to the average like, net worth of... Um, I cover that on a slide, but that's a good question. It's very hard to figure that out, but we have a source from Anglo-Saxon England that said a fieldsman basically peasant levy is a crude translation, but it's what you guys will get, would be paid about a thousand pounds a month for being on campaign. 
So, um, a lot. A cow averaged about 1,500 pounds in, in modern British pounds. Um, so a slave would be somewhere around 3,000 about what you paid for it. Well, you, you broke my vacuum cleaner. Buy me a new one. Um, so this is also what we have assessed probably against people of status. I suspect if you weren't someone of status, they may assess a lower fine just because it hurts you more. We don't know. The sagas only deal with people who matter. Um, one annoying thing that I couldn't find is anyone bother to write down what happened if you couldn't pay the fine or someone couldn't help you pay it. Just a gap in all of our sources. You'd think someone have written that down, but no one did. My assumption is outlawry. So, because they couldn't imprison people. Debtor's prison wasn't a thing. Um, you could be outlawed in Iceland. It was either minor or major. Minor, they kick, <clears throat> they kick you out of Iceland for three years. Major, uh, you are out of Iceland forever. When you are an outlaw, either minor or major, you can be killed on sight. So um, you had a very good impetus to get out of Iceland as a minor outlaw. Uh, as a major outlaw, no one would probably get let you on your boat unless you had a lot of money. Uh, but being an outlaw, you'd forfeit your holding, so good luck. Uh, there was a question raised in the back. Hi. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, because I remember either hearing about this in a class or reading it somewhere, um, that it, it may have to happen in other societies. Were there any instances of someone having a debt and then selling themselves into the problem to pay the debt? I haven't read about that, but I, w I would honestly imagine it was a thing. I don't know because it's not someone something someone has ever asked me. I would need to look that up. That's why I like doing this. People always ask me questions that I don't know an answer to, so it's more things to look research. I can't say I've heard of that as well, but I don't know the source. I think in Dresser Saga, there's like a side side mention where one character it happens to somebody they knew. Um, so like a friend of a friend knew a guy who did it. Like yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um. But to this, so regardless of how ironclad your case may be, if A, you didn't have a lawyer to speak for you, if you didn't know the law yourself, um, a path to being a well-respected member of society, they valued clever people, they valued people who could think, so you could never raise a sword in your life and still be well-respected if you were good at law. Um, if you weren't, you better know someone who was, because who would speak for you mattered a lot more than who did it. Um, so there was a way around this. If you thought you were going to lose your case, you knew you were going to lose your case because you didn't have one, you challenged someone to a duel. It is a legal resolution to an issue. People are willing to fight for their case. It probably matters to them. If you are challenged, can you refuse? It seems to be yes, and depending on the context, no one would necessarily think less of you, particularly if you were being obstinate but didn't have a case and they challenge you to, to a duel and you're like, all right, he's right. Um, of course, if a 90-year-old man challenged you to a duel and you're a 20-something strapping fighter, yeah, you'd probably lose some honor on that. Um, but if you accept, you'd better show up. Um, because if you don't, that's when you're outlawed, that's when you become a me thing, and you'll probably die. <clears throat> Unless you flee the country, and there are plenty of accounts of sagas of people trying to flee the country, people going, oh, I know where they are in Norway, and Denmark, and Sweden, in the Byzantine Empire, I'm gonna f go find them and kill them. Uh, Mike. Yeah, um... So you said that, uh, you mentioned like if uh, a nine-year-old man challenged you to a duel, and if you refuse to fight that duel, that you would, you know, lose some honor. If you did kill them in that duel, would you lose some honor, or like the fact that would be so a bit inside odd it? for him to do, um, but no, because he's the one who, probably not, because he's the one who challenged. Um, but I get to it, you were allowed to have a substitute fighter. Um, and the honor implications for that were mixed. You challenge a nine-year-old man, he could then get someone who could match you and no one would think less of it. Think less of you for challenging him. Um, but you could have a substitute. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that someone might go out and find someone who was an outlaw. 
Is there like a bounty involved in that? Or like Sometimes family, and... the family who were wrong that led to that guy's outlawry might pay you. But also, hey, you killed an outlaw. There was honor in that. True. And one more question. Uh, were substitute fighters typically like hired or paid, or were they like close friends? I'll talk about that on that slide. <laughs> um, needless to say, in both of these cases, you do lose your legal case. I, I, I had to say it. It kind of is understood, but if you refuse or fail to show up, you lose. Uh, were these to the death? Yes, that is exactly from Princess Bride. You know the scene. Best movie ever. Um, there's accounts of them ending in death. There's accounts of them ending in a, a first bleeding wound. There's accounts of them ending with a wound where someone can, couldn't continue. Getting your butt cheek cut off is probably a, mo a uh, wound that you can't really continue with. Um, they all varied, and Christian Trosclair brought this up earlier. This is an era before standardization was an obsession. These days we want, it's always the same, it's all equal, you know, you know what you're going to get into. Not so much then, they didn't necessarily care. Um, and I also suspect that because we're getting this through Christians writing about pagans a hundred, couple hundred years later, there is nuance we have lost to why some duels were first blood and some duels were to the death. That's something we are probably missing that we may never get unless someone bothers to write down why and we just haven't found it yet. Now, losing kind of sucked. Um, if you died, everything you owned was forfeit. Unless to the person who killed you. Unless you were a foreigner in Norway, in which case the king could have dips. Uh, but generally speaking, the winner in the duel got everything. First blood, um, the fine was described as three marks of silver, which one source said was equivalent to about 12 milk cows. So using, using the sources I could find, that translates to about 22,000 pounds, or call it two years of military service if you didn't buy a single thing. Um, so this price says, wow, you need to have a lot of money to uh, stake something on a duel, because if you can't pay it, oh boy. Um, and that's true. While arguably anyone could challenge anyone to a duel, this fine for losing, ignoring dying, I suppose it's irrelevant if you die, you don't necessarily care, um, that fine meant this was often constrained to nobility, or people with money. Jack? Uh, you said that the uh, winner, how the winner gets everything, does that mean his wife uh, loses his wife also? Potentially. Oh, wow. Now, those of you who play rogues probably <laughs> realize, wait a minute, this doesn't seem like a fair legal system. <laughs> nope. Um, so, there are plenty of accounts, typically of berserkers, which the sagas do treat as a magical force. People, berserkers, generally were, when berserking, immune to getting caught and fought with a lot of strength and all that. Typically, berserkers realized, you know, I'm really dangerous. And that 16-year-old kid over there could barely hold that sword because he didn't need his weenies. He totally called me womanly. Yeah, I'm going to challenge him to a duel. Um, so people made money fighting duels to men they knew they could beat. No one liked them. There was a nickname, Hongdangu, or duelist. We might consider that a mark of honor today. No, that was a bad mark back then. You did not want the nickname duelist unless... You know, you had earned it through some dramatic duel where you had beaten someone who you had no rights to beat. Maybe then it would be a mark of honor. But mostly this was reserved for violent people we wouldn't like. Is there an age limit? Nope. <laughs> 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 um, bear in mind that who you challenge does reflect on you. So challenging someone who didn't stand necessarily an equivalent footing to you wouldn't look good. Hiding in the back. Ian, you said that you could uh, turn down a duel. What is the loss? What is your loss in turning down? You lose your legal case. Um, what you lose in honor varies on why and and how. So, 
You may or may not lose standing, but you'll lose your legal case. And one more question, Mike. Similar question to that. Uh, so if you accepted a duel and then forfeited mid-duel, how does that affect uh, payment and honor? You're forfeiting. You need to ransom yourself. Don't forfeit. <laughs> you're, an, you're an even. Um, the other thing that we see, this comes up in uh, Cormac's saga, Gunnar, he's, he's He-Man. Um, there's no other way to describe him. He's He-Man. He's even blonde. He just has a beard and He-Man's uh, he clean shaven. Um, people who generally knew they were guilty could potentially get out of losing by challenging people to a duel. The thing is, you do this enough times to get a reputation. Gunnar bails out of two, two losing legal cases by challenging them to a duel, and they take a knee and say no. He starts to do that the third time, and his opponent goes, what, are you just going to challenge me to a duel because you know you're going to lose this case? <laughs> and he's like, yes. <laughs> um, and he doesn't, ends up losing the case, but his best friend is the best lawyer in Iceland, and he ends up gaining honor from it because that saga is weird. <laughs> and we all know who this guy is and how many girls he fought, so I hope y'all get that joke. Um, so, and I hope I'm not dating myself with this reference because I know that one's old. Um, yes, you could have a substitute fighter. I'm going to give two accounts from El Saga um, where this happens. Basically, a weaker man could have someone step in for them in fight in his place. <clears throat> sometimes it's paid. Sometimes the if someone fights a duel on your behalf, they get the spoils for winning, not you. Um, but usually your honor relatively stayed intact, assuming you had a reason for a substitute, provided he didn't win. Because, <clears throat> uh, man, it would suck if your champion died in the duel... And then you get all of the honor loss from that guy losing the duel, and you got to live with it. Um, so it's a bit unclear exactly what this would do to your honor. Cases varied, and again, we have lost context over a thousand years. James? This may be a question that you don't know the answer to, but if you get a champion to fight for you and they die, could their family sue mm -hmm. you for their death? Reasonably, more likely they'd sue the person who killed them. Okay. So, context I didn't get into because I only have so much time, but the home guy was considered a way to rein in feuds. It didn't work, that's why they got rid of it, but it was a way to rein in feuds because if you killed someone in what we call an Einvigi, if you killed someone just in a, we're angry, their best friend might challenge you to a duel, and then you die, and your best friend challenged him to a duel. You can see how bad this can get very quickly. So they're meant to curtail violence by limiting it, and supposedly if someone had died in a duel, their family members <clears throat> didn't have a right to, for a reprisal. Water. Um, but that wasn't always the case. Christian. Yeah, so it, it sounds like these were relatively litigious. Uh, so is Not it, is relatively. Okay. <laughs> they make modern American society look afraid of lawyers. So, so my, my question to you is, do we, do we think that, that is an artifact of the actual like remaining legacy that we have? Yeah. Oh, do, you, do you follow my question? Yeah, so our sagas deal, like, Yal Saga is huge on dealing with legal cases. El Saga has a lot of legal cases. Cormac Saga sees duels used to resolve legal cases. Um, some of it may be in a distorted view because this is interesting stuff. But understand, Iceland had five courts. The fifth one established because Njal needed to get his um, protege married and needed to make him a gothi, so he established a court. It's Yell Saga, as I said, is a fun one to read for being absurd. Okay. Um, but Iceland had four, five courts, okay. and they continued that after. So whether or not this is a distorted view from the sagas, it's still clear 
legal cases were very big. Okay, thank you. This, you there. This may well be outside the scope of this lecture, but what would a legal case, legal proceeding look like if a duel was not involved? Um, to summarize it rather quickly, um, hello, Jarl, or, or King, who was ever running this thing. I am putting a legal case against um, Kyle. Um, he attacked me. I defended myself, and then he ran off. Kyle would be called to the stage. Um, no, I didn't, because here, due to this legal proceeding, it was a justified attack. He said I had been buggered. Um, that's literally listed in the sagas as a reason to kill someone with no reprisal. And then, well, my lawyer here actually says, no, that wasn't justified. You have lawyers. Well, Kyle's like, I'm going to have character witnesses because you say that, that about everyone. They're not going to tell you that. So where you get a bunch of people talking for you. In El Saga, a guy he tries to sue gets 12 people to swear on his behalf. Um, in Yal Saga... Before a complicated legal case, they go around all of the booths at an all thing going, Hey, will you support me? Hey, will you support me? Hey, uh, no, I killed your buddy. Uh, hey, will you support me? <laughs> uh, yes? Yeah, uh, sure, wrap my head around the, uh, I guess the cycle you mentioned in there. Like, if somebody kills someone and their best friend challenges you and then you die. Read Yell Saga. <laughs> I'll summarize it at the end. I'm not kidding. Read the old saga. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm not being relatively litigious. Like, to Icelanders, uh, law was more important than religion to them. It was the fabric that held society together. Like, law was. If you're Njal, if you're Gunnar, swords held society. <laughs> if anybody wants to talk about, like, Icelandic legal society, come talk to me afterwards. I can, I've done a lot of research on this. I'm happy to talk to you. <laughs> Seriously, go talk to him. <laughs> At some point, I can only talk, give you so much. I only have an hour, and I am going to run over, but I'm sorry. You keep asking questions, so I'm going to run over. Sorry, Veronica, if you're hiding in the back. Um, I'm actually getting most of the way through this, so we're not going to run too late. Um, so, what did they fight with? Uh, sword and board? Traditionally. That was considered the dueling um, weapon. Um, they described the ideal dueling sword as 32 inches long, which is actually not a bad length for a saber either, um, and a shield. And except for all of the duels where these rules were completely violated. Um, the thing is, we do know that people who were a little unsavory and didn't own a sword might go up to their uncle and go, hey, I got a duel, can I borrow a sword? and then do anything but duel with it. Um, so it was considered noble to duel sword and shield. Ale Saga violates that. Cormac Saga violates that. Tradition versus practice never agrees. What did they fight on? Here we get to the island part. Congrats, we are an hour in and I'm finally explaining the title of this presentation. <laughs> um, so Cormac Saga gives the most beautiful account of the dueling rules. Some scholars thought he made them up completely. Um, others say he must have been coming from a compendium that we don't have anymore, and that's why he has these rules pretty, pretty well thought out. But in Cormac's saga, you have this big complicated thing, which we are not going to build here, um, where you have an 8x8 eight eight, um, cloak on the ground. That's where you fight. Three furrows dug around it. Um... The cloak is held down with pegs, then you have some rope and some hazel posts around it. Hazel has magical properties, so this is supposed to ward off evil spirits and potentially deal with berserker magic um, inside this ring. So we have this big complicated ring system, yet El Saga has a duel that happens at an all thing, and they don't use this at all. They just put them on an island surrounded by stones. <clears throat> so... How literal the island was varied, and there's a theory that the reason why any of them are described on an island is later, the later people writing down these sagas, so a whole gang means walking to a, a small island, missed it was figurative, and they've always supposed to have been on cloaks. 
Um, all of the accounts here, being on a cloak, being in a ring, being on an island, all of them are contemporary. A lot of them are in Norway, some of them are in Iceland. The rules, we're not sure. Again, no standardization, that was for later. Could you wear armor? Uh, this is also one of those things that the scholarly journals just didn't bother to tell me. Um, and the rules that we have don't tell you either. They don't say if you could use armor or not. In El Saga, he wears a helmet. Um, but that's the only account we have. Notice what I am wearing. I'm wearing two layers of wool. I have linen underneath that as my underwear, if you will. Um, so good luck cutting through this unless you mean it. Um, so the wounds, like someone has a rib broken in one of the duels in Cormac Saga. Was he wearing chainmail? Maybe. Was he wearing a bunch of layers of wool and linen and it just didn't cut? Just as likely. We know maybe he could have worn armor. We don't know how common it was. Unfortunately, the a lot of the accounts of wounds that I saw, cuts to the face, cuts to the thigh, even wearing a male hauberk, it's reasonable to get your butt cheek cut off if you bend wrong or it's short. <laughs> so it's not clear. However, don't use magic. Um, they were concerned about magic in the duels. So going back to Cormac Saga, um, they have this pretty complicated spell that they don't give us the spell for, so we're not quite sure what it's for, but you're basically supposed to bend over, put your head between your legs, hold on to your ears, and um, speak the Fjolnsner, uh, which is the swearing spell. So that doesn't help us either. There's theories this was meant to get rid of evil spirits, maybe shut off the berserker magic that stopped them getting cut by swords. Again, um... Not sure they didn't bother to write that down. These sagas are notorious for missing the details we want. They say things like, and then they traveled, you know, to a farmstead. They don't tell us what they had for baggage animals. They don't tell us what they used for wagons. They're just like, and they traveled. Well, that's like a two or three day journey. Are you going to carry all that on a pack? Like, they miss the day-to-day -day details that would make a lot of this a lot easier. You're like, oh yeah, you know it. I don't need to tell you. I would never tell you. I say someone does laundry. I don't bother to tell you that they throw a detergent in and put it on the wrong cycle and can't make sense of their laundry, their uh, washing machine. No, we don't know that. The sagas suffer very heavily from the same thing. Yes, Mike? Does that have anything to do with the phrase, uh, put your head between your legs and kiss your ass goodbye? Probably not. There are, so as a brief, another brief uh, tangent. So I mentioned that suggesting someone had been buggered was um, a very bad insult. Some of these scholarly articles are borderline pornographic. <laughs> and this, some have gone so far as to say, what are you exposing yourself to when you bend over and put your head between your legs? As a way to say, hey, evil spirits, come to me, I am now banishing you. Um... Seriously, some of the articles, I'm like, man, I've seen less raunchy fan fiction. <laughs> these these scholars, scholars need to get out more. Um, so, the other thing, um, and this is probably the weirdest thing, is that this is my last point before I get into examples, so I'm not doing a half bad on time. Um, but... In Cormac Saga, the duels in Iceland often account having a friend, someone who, who meant something to you, hold the shield. You got three shields, and the dueling shields tended to be made of softer wood than something you'd use on the battlefield. Um, so they get chewed up, and if you had all your shields chewed up, your friend who's holding them, who's defending you, goes, See ya? <laughs> and you have to defend yourself with your sword. I hope you know parries. Um, it is a little weird. Um, but, yeah, they held your shield for you and were supposed to do good things with your shield. You focused on cutting. Poor Bercy there had a shield bearer. He screwed up and Bercy got his butt cut off. <laughs> Choose someone you know. The other thing is uh, if, depending on the rules of the duel... You also wanted a friend there, one, to vouch for you winning, two, if you died, 
you might challenge that guy to a duel and avenge your death. And it continues, presumably until one, one side runs out of people. Now, you laugh, but even in 1700s Ireland, we have accounts of small sword duels, seven, eight, nine participants. <laughs> Some all at once. It must have just looked like a big free fencing room. Other times, literally, all right, they fight. Oh, they both killed each other. Well, this isn't resolved. They fight. Oh, they both killed each other. Oh, this isn't resolved. <laughs> there's actually, I don't know if there's an account, and I don't know if you can help me, Mr. I know all of the sagas better. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm not making fun of you. But, um... I don't know what you I don't know what <laughs> You got the swords. If there is a double. Usually in the Icelandic rules, you took turns making strikes, so a double would be rather hard. Literally, you took turns attacking each other. It was supposed to be first blood, very regulated, very controlled. But not every duel took turns, so I have no idea what happens if there's a double. That doesn't make good saga literature, so they probably didn't write it down. Is it first blood on your shield bearer? Or on uh, your... <laughs> All of them that I know of also never have the shield guy get hit. You kill him <laughs> and is the duel over? Or? Or is it like, if, it's, if it's like a regular, yeah, like, if it's a regular, yeah, like, 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 it was like, okay, it's my turn to attack, it feels like it'll be less likely to hit the shield bear. Like, here's yeah. like, a scrum, the shield bear is in the middle of it, that sucks. I think that's why this was possible, is because you could have someone hold the shield if you're taking turns, and we also have a Counts of people who had metal wasn't the most reliable. Ah, oh, crap! I got to straighten my sword again. Hema, a thousand AD. <laughs> uh, last question, and then I want to try to keep going to not be too late. So, if they have turns and they're both fighting on an island, was pushing them out of the ring a thing, or was it just like when you step out of the uh, ring? Oh, wasn't generally gentlemanly to grapple. Um, punching, kicking, some of that was okay. Um, Unfortunately, for, forgetting <laughs> the exact uh, reading on that, um, but shoving him out of bounds was bad. He backed up, one foot out, you're on thin ice, two feet out, oh, you ran, you lose. Presumably that was the furl, so you back up and you fall on your ass. <laughs> Last question that I, I should keep going. Uh, I, was, I just wanted to ask, I presume you've, you've fetched this format before. What's it like? What's the dynamic? I actually have not done the taking turns. Well, we gotta do because it. Because I can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, Next year. I have done plenty of work with sword and board, but, you know, Viking style. Haven't done the taking turns. Um, I know people who have, and they're like, you really need to work to wrap your mind around what you're doing. But once you figure it out, it's not terrible. Um, the issue, I suppose, would be if your shield bearer is like six foot five and 250 pounds, then you're me. You wouldn't want me as your shield bearer. I would not want me as my shield bearer. No, I can't get around him. Um, but that's enough academic stuff. Um, Let's talk about some duels. First, though, I gotta introduce you to Al Skallagrimson, or in modern Icelandic, Al Skallagrimson. Um, he is a warrior poet. Japan loves to pretend they're samurai, have a monopoly on warrior poets. Being an accomplished poet, being good with words, being smart and clever and quick, um, was a valued trait. Al very much embodied that. I could talk a lot about Ale. If he was a D&D &D character in your party, you would hate him, he'd get bounced out. The DM would be having sidebars like, dude, you're making it really hard for everyone else to get any information because you keep losing your shit with people over nothing. <laughs> but I'm going to summarize this with one story from his childhood which probably explains a lot. Ale was playing a ball game against someone older than him when he was about seven or eight. Kid was older than him, like, think 13 or 14. Despite Ale being a saga hero, and therefore largely a Superman, can you imagine how a ball game, they don't give us the rules, but can you imagine how a ball game would go between a seven-year-old and a 14-year-old? 
poorly for Ale. But Ale's like, I God, I can't lose. He must be cheating. So he goes home and asks for an axe. <laughs> they're like here take it uh, I don't know any wood that needs to be chopped but go for it <laughs> there was wood that needed to be chopped if you want to be figurative about that older boy's head <laughs> Al walks up buries the axe in his head that's for cheating and leaves this causes a feud that kills 20 people El Saga, tre El Saga treats that as a footnote <laughs> <laughs> this was a society that was not unaware of violence. Um, and that could be a little bit of the Christians trying to paint them as barbarous. Maybe. Um, so Ale goes home. Now a proper Viking tells people about his killings. People obviously saw this. It was not done in secret. But he should probably tell his parents. Generally speaking, if your seven or eight year old kid Burying an axe in another kid's head in gym class, you'd want to know. <laughs> in response, and this explains Ale, good boy. You'll make a great Viking. Ale, in response, composes a verse. Anyone who's seen the Vikings knows this verse because it starts, my mother told me that someday I would buy. That's a a loose translation of Ale basically saying, I'm going to make a great Viking, my mommy told me so. <laughs> I mean, that entire song is based off this? Yep. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that, that adds a great dynamic to that show. <laughs> when you know the theme song is based off a homicidal seven-year-old. Well, <laughs> it, was, it was Ivor the Bull that did it in the show they, like, at that point. Like skull splitter guy. It may that? be a recurring theme. I haven't heard it. To tri I know it's attributed to Ale. It is yeah. possible in the show that was they, a nod. In the show they did Ivor, though. So. Ivor Anyways. has enough other issues. I know. <laughs> in that show. Um, the saga heroes are anti-heroes at best. <laughs> <laughs> if he buried that axe in that kid's head without really challenging him to a duel, how do you not rip the knife? Because he said afterwards. He said he did it. He was insulted. The few 20 people, at some point, someone got blood vengeance. <laughs> like he walked up from the front, right? So he could have defended himself. The sun was up. So, yeah. The sagas do, like, the laws, the traditions were one thing. These sagas do violate them, um, but then again, how many social norms do we have that are totally permissible to violate with, for reasons that you couldn't necessarily think of? Like, yeah, of course. Um, let's talk about his first duel. Um, the second, no, oh, it's a duel. <laughs> <laughs> so, is he chewing on his shield? Yeah. Common <laughs> berserker <laughs> iconography shows them chewing on their shields. Oh, yeah. Oh, There's a really famous uh, chess set where yeah. uh, this is definitely a bit of a modernism, and by modernism I mean 1200s. Um, but I chose to do it. I did these drawings so you'd have characters. Um, Ale, Ale as an interesting point, is often thought as having Paget's disease. So he had abnormal bone growth. Um, he was probably fairly ugly. Very crudely. You could or Ron Perlman, but you could describe him as Ron Perlman with a beard. <laughs> so that, imagine that when you're trying to figure out what this guy looks like. Anyhow, Ailes has a wife, and through the starting events of Ailes Saga, wife has a dubious claim on some land in Norway. Ailes is not really liked in Norway due to, you can imagine the guy who kills someone at seven and gets praised for it, probably isn't the nicest to have around. But nonetheless, he's like, I'm going to go to Iceland, um, sorry, Norway, to go get this land, despite his wife going, it, it's fine, we, we live in Iceland, what does, good does it do us? And while he's there, he's like, man, I should probably stay at the houses of people that like me. And one of them, um, friend of a friend, you know, you better have a good reputation if you want to stay anywhere, but they have a big feast, and they notice this family is... Kind of sad. And Loke the Pale is the reason. They have a 
daughter and a son, and a mother. I don't believe there's a father in, in the picture. Um, and Lope the Pale wants to marry that daughter, because he's a, he's a berserker and he's Swedish, but he's like, you know, wife would be great. I got enough money. Oh, you said no, because I'm a berserker and I'm Swedish. Um, they, they make a big deal about him being Swedish um, in the sagas. Um, all right, son, fight me. And the son, imagine, like, accomplished berserker against, like, they don't give his age, but against, like, a 16-year-old uh, dweeb. Um, and they know he's going to die horribly, so the mother guilt trips Ale into fighting this duel for him. Well, if your best friend was here, he'd do it. And I was like, all right, fine. And so they go to the appointed grounds, and Al looks at Lope the Pal and goes, yeah, that kid was screwed. I better fight this. <laughs> uh, and Lope goes, you know, there's no honor in killing a 16-year-old computer geek. I should probably fight Al. Uh, but he's a berserker. Berserkers can't just fight. They got to they gotta amp themselves up. So while he's listening to uh, Yield, I have the tiger, <laughs> um, Al is insulting him. <laughs> Come on, get on with it. So they do, and Al's like, well, this guy's a berserker. I'm not going to let him get a strike in edgewise, pointwise, or flatwise. And he throws a flurry of blows at Lode. And Lode eventually goes, oh my god, I'm running, I'm sucking wind, I need a break. Please give me a break. <laughs> Al's just like, sure. But I'm gonna insult you the whole time. <laughs> so, the entire time that Lode is sucking wind... Ale's just like, your father was a hamster and your mother smelled of elderberry. Um, eventually, Lode's like, all right, I'm ready, I'm ready. And Ale's just like, all right, I'm done with this. Punches uh, Lode's shield so hard with the sword, Lode's arm goes numb, the shield drops, and Ale cuts off Lode's leg. Needless to say, Lode lost that duel. He dies. Ale is now entitled to all of Lode's holdings. This guy is a well-known duelist, so it's quite a bit. He just has to get it from the, the uh, Norwegian king, who also has a claim. Not totally relevant to the story. Uh, but Al has a claim to a lot of money. So when that son goes back here, have some silver for, like, fighting the duel on my behalf. Thank you for saving my life. Al's like, no, I don't need it. The uh, reward of the fun of the duel was enough. <laughs> Never mind all the land he got. It kind of rings hollow <laughs> when he refused, like, a 50 knowing you just earned a hundred grand. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I really need to get to the reason I was in Norway. And it's this Danny DeVito looking guy here. <laughs> um, Atlee the Short. Atlee has inherited the land that his wife has a tentative claim to. So Al, grabs 20 men who don't hate his guts or are terrified of him, same thing, um, and goes up to Atlee, and the lion goes, give me. <laughs> Take me to court. I ain't gonna give this to you. Um, and Atlee goes, sure. Atlee goes to court, and Atlee goes, I don't have his property. I don't know what you're talking about. These 12 guys swear I don't have your, his property. And Al realizes that, well, his wife, father may have never legitimately married that lady, so he may have never legitimately owned it. And that's got 12 guys who like him and about five different people here I probably owe money to because I've killed one of their relatives. Uh, fight me. <laughs> and Atlee goes, yeah, yeah, I'll fight you. I'll fight you, it's fine. Um, so it's at an all thing. So big fanfare, they got a sacrificial bowl. Um, they set up the ring, and by that they just say, go to the island over there, it's got stones already around it, like, it's the island we use for all of these duels, and they fight. They both have a spear, although the translation for what Ale um, uses is often translated as thrusting halberd. Another problem with saga translations, everything not a sword, spear, axe, or knife, gets translated as halberd. The, one of the weapons we know they didn't have. <laughs> the problem is there's no translation. So people trying to modernize it just use Halberd because it's close enough. Anyhow, they hop their spears at each other. 
nothing happens, and they start wailing on each other with swords. Um, the shields are eaten up, so now they're fighting basically arming sword on arming sword, only this is a Viking era sword, so you don't have anything for hand protection. Not even the token cross guard you get on arming swords. And Ale hits Atlee once. Doesn't do anything. It's again. Doesn't do anything. A third time. Doesn't do anything. It's like, well, this sucks. <laughs> um, and he knows. Hang on. He's using magic. Man, we probably should make sure we got the words of that spell right because it was supposed to dispel that, but whatever. <laughs> I am betting he is protected against the bite of all sorts. Think, think, think. Ale drops his sword. Throws Atlee to the ground, kneels on his chest, and bites out his throat. <laughs> he was protected against the bite of swords. <laughs> Ale is probably a little worked up, and he has the right to sacrifice the ball. There's supposed to be ceremony with this. This is Ale. Ceremony is not his forte. And he runs over, grabs the bowl by the nose, Grabs the bull by the horn with his other hand, flips it over, slams it on the ground, breaks its back, and then goes, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Sorry. Just got a little worked up there. <laughs> Needless to say, he does inherit the land and then promptly sells it and runs away because he realizes he shouldn't be in Norway. <laughs> so you have a duel with a substitute that was low at the bell, where the winner does stand to inherit a lot of property. You have a duel meant to resolve a distinct legal dispute. So that more or less wraps things up. Um, so we talk about the Vikings as being barbarians, right? Uh, Iceland got rid of dueling in 1006 AD. Norway in 1014. Denmark was a little slower. They're like 1074. Excuse me. Uh, whoever has a Kia uh, uh, with the Ontario plates, their interior lights are on. Thank you. You're welcome. There you go. Um, Jean de Gris and his little uh, tryst there. <laughs> that ended judicial dueling in France. What was that, 1386? Um, England, it's the late 1600s before they outlawed judicial <laughs> dueling there. And the U.S. has technically never outlawed judicial dueling. Hell yeah! Hell yeah! USA! 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 I'm sorry. Still legal in Jersey. Sorry, the last duel in England was 1597. I was off by a century. Nonetheless, they didn't actually realize they should probably ban them until 1819. So, <laughs> Vikings, barbarians, they go maybe resolving court cases with fights to the death is, in, is not particularly fair. So, how barbarous were they? Probably not as bad as we like to say. Now, I'd like to end with two sagas to read. The first is Shockingly Ale Saga. Best description of Ale. Murder hobo wreaks havoc through Norway <laughs> while spitting hot fire. This is a guy who kills Eric Bloodaxe's son, gets shipwrecked, gets captured by Eric Bloodaxe, and talks his way out of it, making Eric think that it was an amazing praise poem, but Al himself just insulted him for like 500 verses. <laughs> Eric Bloodaxe is not painted as particularly intelligent. You can thank political tensions in Iceland at the time. The other one is Njal Saga. Um, if this doesn't sound like a hell of a sitcom, nothing does. Njal and Gunnar are best friends. Their wives hate each other. The resulting feud kills basically everyone. <laughs> <laughs> there is a theory that Njal Saga is intended to be satire. With a description like that, I tend to buy it. For places to pursue... Um, my Viking group does not maintain a beautiful database of uh, uh, Viking encyclopedia. That falls to Hurstwick. Um, Bill Short, who's written a couple books on this, I highly recommend Men of Terror if you want to read about Viking combat. Um, it's the head of that group. They have a beautiful, well-researched uh, website that covers all of the details that we know for certain. They're all light reads. Because... Um, <laughs> There's a lot of BS, and what we know for certain is somewhat limited. They make sure everything they post is very well vetted. 
Um, for those who have long commutes, um, or like podcast, <coughs> Saga Thing Podcast, um, goes through all the sagas with the context that you do, that you are missing, so you don't need to be a Viking uh, historian to actually get what they're talking about, because the sagas don't handhold. And neither does the movie The Northmen. Um, if you know Hamlet, you know the story, but The Northmen deals with Atlas Saga, a saga we actually don't have, we just know of. Um, but basically, this is the closest to a good saga movie that I've ever seen in the most accurate representation of Viking culture. <clears throat> it doesn't do any hand-holding. If you don't know the religious shorthand they're using, good luck. <laughs> the other, you'll notice the Vikings on the History Channel is not on here. <laughs> the other thing I recommend <laughs> is the show Norsemen. It's a Norwegian production. It's a black comedy. Yeah, they have some fantasy looks to it. But I have never seen a comedy that nails the Viking era as good as that does. They make kind of fun of the culture. They hit all the high notes. They hit the nuances. Like, it will teach you a lot better than the Vikings ever will. And uh, my citations, if anyone wants to see them. Um, well, a lot of questions, but not bad. Only 20 minutes over. Um, and that concludes my presentation. So, uh, She needs. Did you answer the Thor and the dress question? What was that? Did you answer the Thor and the dress question? So, if people ask more about that single gender and the, the violations of the gender norms I was going to, we talk a lot about how rigid they were and they violated all the time, but no one would ever question Thor and call a woman. Sure. It, it what about 